Hey, hey, this is Brian Crescenti. And I'm Tony Bernhardt Jr. And we're joining you with another episode of This is Level Infinite. Hey, Tony, are you an audiophile? Like, are you into music? Man, to be honest, it's like everyday routine. I wake up to it. I go to the gym to it. It's in the car. Um, I do my chores to it. So yeah, it's like water to me. I don't think that I could live without it. What about you, BC? Can I call you BC? Uh, no, no, you can't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't have the best hearing in the world, unfortunately, for a lot of reasons. But despite that, I've really gotten into high definition music lately. I think it started because I picked up a, a Sony Walkman, the new ones, not the the old tape players. Oh, good. And it lets you listen to this sort of beefy, uncompressed music. Yeah, I've been kind of messing around with the spatial audio titles and Apple Music that they just launched. So do you think you can really tell a difference? You, you know, it's funny. Uh, I don't think so because <laughs> what what I've read since getting really into it is that you won't be able to tell the difference until you start listening to lo-fi music. So it basically ruins music for you. So like you can't tell it's better, but you can definitely tell when it's worse. So as I was doing this, as I was kind of getting into all this music, that, of course, led me to records. Uh-oh. I feel a Brian Crescente segue coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I've got to get more subtle, I think. <laughs> so, you know, there are a number of companies out there right now that actually release full video game soundtracks on vinyl. And they include companies like Mondo and Mbada. And I think the one that maybe you could say started it all, I am 8-Bit. Yes. And today... We're going to be talking about all things video game music. I mean, from the creation of some of the traditional soundtracks by famed composer Yespa Kid to how GTFO creates its creepy, blood-pumping procedural music to the birth of video game vinyl and why everyone seems to be into video game music these days. For John Gibson, it started with Tron. While video games have a long, deep history of creating amazing earworms to accompany their colorful play, the singularly focused, sometimes tedious music found in early gaming has slowly given way to an increasingly eclectic and powerful mix of robust soundscapes. Music from games like Donkey Kong Country, Doom, Earthbound, and Grim Fandango in the 90s helped set the stage for what would become this explosion of musical creativity for video games. Now, hardcore fans of video games often reminisce about their favorite in-game soundtracks. I know I do. But back in the 2000s, or aughts if you prefer, it was really rare to find a way to listen to them outside of the game, and definitely not on vinyl. Yeah, and that's where John comes in. He got his start as a game journalist, and then in the summer of 2005, he launched an art exhibit at an LA gallery that helped usher video games into the pop art zeitgeist with works that reimagined iconic video games through the lens of myriad artists. It was called I Am 8-Bit. That segued into a career working with game publishers to create these amazing promotional experiences, like a pop-up Street Fighter club in a New York bodega, or creating a tricell progenitor virus detection kit to promote Resident Evil 5. And it was around that time that Disney approached his production company, I Am 8-Bit, about creating a record for Tron Evolution. Now, that's the video game launched in 2010, which of course was tied to the Tron Legacy film. They asked us if we ever had made a vinyl record before. And we're like, no, but we'll figure it out. And and this was in a time when like vinyl wasn't super popping either. Like it was one of those things where a lot of plants were just going out of business. And it wasn't particularly easy to make a record or find someone who had great expertise in making that kind of thing well. But we're like, yeah, sure. Like, And so we went and visited some plants and talked to some folks and made a couple hundred copies of this Tron Evolution vinyl and, and sent it out to some media as a mailer. Uh, with a little note attached that said, like, hey, like, there's this new game coming out. Here's some cool music from Sasha. It looks like a disc from Tron. Like, we did, like, a picture disc, and and the album art was by this guy, Jim Rugg, and he made the light cycle look like turntables. It was just, like, a cool, simple design project and fun for us. That first vinyl became an instant collectible, soon selling on eBay and Discogs for more than $1,000 a pop. John called it lightning in a bottle. That really started us thinking, like, well, no one's really doing this for video game music. That's kind of bizarre. Like, you you only really saw a couple independent artists like Jim Guthrie minting their own vinyl, but never really like a label that was doing it. 
that was pursuing it, especially pursuing all these game soundtracks that, that are locked away in vaults by giant corporations. So we also did some 45s for a, a Wolfenstein event in Boston during PAX East. It was the, the very first Wolfenstein game that Bethesda put out. And we gave out a 45, we made three of them, to each attendee. So you got one of three. And there was a couple songs on each, uh, you know, it was like House of the Rising Sun, but but a German cover of it. And it was this alternate universe version. And we uh, we didn't put the Wolfenstein logo on it. Uh, we, we treated it like it was a, its own record label from the 1960s, as if it was like a USO party. It was, it was within the context of the party. We thought it was a cute party favor that you could walk away with. But again, we saw this fervor around it on eBay where people were flipping these for hundreds of dollars. And you know, when you when you think about the actual cost of what a forty five would be in a store, you know, you're you're talking like ten, twelve bucks uh, for a, a new thing. But when you see hundreds of dollars, you're like, wow, there's this insatiable appetite for for this kind of collectible merch that that is interactive and and you know appreciation forward. With two promo discs selling like gangbusters in the second hand market, John and I am eight bit co owner Amanda White decided to take the plunge and produce their first full video game soundtrack on vinyl. They linked up with Devolver Digital and convinced them to allow I Am 8-Bit to create a vinyl for the game Hotline Miami, and it was a runaway hit. And get this, since then, the company has released more than 160 records based on video game music. And there's no doubt that those vinyls are amazing, tangible collections of not just the game's music, but the fresh art that's usually found on both the sleeve and the disc. But at the heart of it all, it's the music that keeps bringing fans back for more. It's really just a medium. People love music, and like just because it's attached to games doesn't make it any less or more. It's just music that came from a different source. And that's what's become fascinating about game music in particular. Like if you listen to something pleasurable in your living room on a, on a vinyl record, it doesn't matter where it came from. You know, when we play things in the office or like send someone a, a soundtrack to listen to, we don't really provide context for for where it came from or how big that game is or how small that game is or how indie it is or if it even came out or not. Like, It's just really about judging it on its listenability and if it makes us happy or if it, it puts us in a certain mood and sets a certain vibe. So it's hard to say like when it happened for game music, but I I feel like it stopped being about writing a really good theme song that you just repeat over and over. And it started just to be about setting a, a mood or a vibe at some point. But I think once we got away from the MIDI soundtrack and we could have orchestras or bands or, you know, guitar or drums and it, the fidelity was there, like it stopped being about seeming like it was from a video game and it was just music. So outside of the context of games, it's it's kind of cool to listen to music in that way. And and that that's really the factor for us is, is the music good just on its own and is it then made even better if it recalls the memories and emotional cadences that you felt when you were playing the game? That's like a bonus. These days, music for video games takes many forms. Some games rely on existing pop music to fill the time in a game, while others build sweeping soundscapes to underscore and magnify the key moments. Video game music can also be just as interactive as the game itself. Yes But Kid is a master of all forms of sound design and music, creating soundtracks and soundscapes for television, film, and video games. He's perhaps best known for his work on the Hitman, Assassin's Creed, and Borderlands series. Currently, though, he's working on the soundtrack for Warhammer 40K Dark Tide. I was 13 years old when I, my brother and I we got a Commodore 64. And that was kind of like where video games and interest in video game music started for me. I knew I wanted to be, you know, part of that, but I wasn't sure how to do it. And so the demo scene was introduced to me and I was fascinated with this. This was a place where you could create music, you could create graphics, you know, you could work with programmers. And it was kind of an introduction to the game industry in a way. And, it, it, you know, it, just to explain what a demo is, I mean, the demos we were working on, I would, I kind of call them music videos. So they would be like these five, eight, ten minute presentations where people would show off their talents as far as programming or graphics or music. 
And one of the great things about that is it was done because people just love doing it. It wasn't done for profit, you know. It was it was just a hobby, and that was just such a great way to figure out how to make music. By the time Jespa was 17, he was making music for games played on systems like the Sega Genesis. From there, his work continued to grow to the point where he was creating music for major games like Hitman, Splinter Cell, and Assassin's Creed. And as Brian mentioned, Jespa is now working on the music for Warhammer 40k Darktide. Now, this is the third Warhammer title he's worked on. His first was Warhammer End Times, Vermintide in 2015. And then he composed the music for Warhammer Vermintide 2. With every game, Jespa said he starts by talking with the developers to figure out what music they're looking for, what expectations they have. These days, he said, he's given pretty free reign to create the sound for a game. There's a lot of conversations and there's a lot of experimentation, sending ideas back and forth. And embracing what the developers are looking at is very important for me. Because often you get involved with a game that's so early that you can't just look at the game and say, hey, this is going to be my inspiration because the game might not have any textures, you know, or it's missing a lot of stuff. And you don't really get a feeling for what this game is going to feel like or even look like. And so concept art is one of those things I like to rely on. I like to look at the same imagery that the developer looks at, the the graphic teams especially. Jespa used some very creative ideas in his approach to Vermintide 2. For instance, the game uses a sort of made-up language for the vocals. Jesper said he researched ancient Hungarian folk poems, and then he recorded his own voice while using a thick Scandinavian accent. His decision to record the vocals himself gave him the confidence, he said, to do all of the vocals for other soundtracks, like Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I mean, it's crazy the kind of research that goes into these things. He even created special musical instruments specifically for Vermintide 2. The thinking there is to create something that you haven't really, uh, you know, heard before or something that feels like it's quite alien to what you would expect. Vermintide 2, it's such a crazy world when you think about it, you know? I mean, these uh, big, scathing creatures that you come up against. I mean, the thinking is you are going to be thrown into this world that is inhabited by Skaven and very much the idea is to to create the music score from the perspective of the Skaven. So it's not like a score that at all times follow the emotion of the player, which is something that often happens in games. It's more about creating world building, if you will, something that just sits there and it's a fully fleshed out world and we're going to put you in the middle of it and you're going to just be there and, and, and good luck with that, you know? So I very much joined the dark side for that one and embraced being a member of Skaven society, uh, you know, kind of mad scientist approach to a lot of the music. You know, if you hear like a synth or an organ in there, it always sounds a little off and, and, and sounds like the mad scientist did his best, but, you know, this is as good as he could get this sound <laughs> or something like that. It's almost like a Skaven band that's playing the music. And that was a very conscious decision that we talked about quite a lot. And as far as these instruments goes, we did custom percussion instruments for Vermintide too. And it was all about the sound we were getting. So we would build these elaborate percussion instruments, you know, using iron boards and mic stands or whatever to, you know, with broken drums and with rice beads or, or whatever. And, you know, to get this thing that when you hit it, it just sounded like, what the hell is this, you know? And that was the approach for all those custom instruments. It's something that not necessarily you can take with you on a plane or something. It's like once the score is done, you know, uh, that stuff was put away, <laughs> you know? Jesper's current project is his work on the music for Warhammer 40k Darktide. It's starting from scratch. You know, there is chaos in Darktide as well. 
So there's a little bit of that kind of chaos vibe in some of the score. Now, I can't give too much of it away, but I would say by far, I mean, I started from scratch on anything and then brought in a little bit of chaos later. But it's very much an electronic, fused, far future score inspired more by life in the epic hive city of Tertian, you know, that has all these ancient machines that inspires the music. It has like pseudo-religious choirs and anthemic pipe organs and, you know, all these things in there to represent both the chaos and the Imperium and also, of course, the far future that this game is set in. While we don't know yet what the future holds for Jespa's Dark Tide soundtrack, the soundtrack for Warhammer Vermintide 2 was released as a double LP with 38 tracks from Yespa's original score. Those vinyls are created in response to a surging interest in video game music that Yespa can't help but notice. Well, I do think there's increased interest in video game music. I can certainly feel it. I feel it in different ways. For example, all the concerts we're doing, there just seems to be such a demand for video game concerts in opera houses around the world. And that is something I am just so pleased to see and I'm getting more and more involved with this. The latest one being the Assassin's Creed Symphony tour. There's just a lot of good things happening and it's all coming together and creating so much interest in video games. It's interesting, Brian. I think that one of the more intriguing aspects of video game music is its ability to not just sort of reflect on what's going on in the game, but it also kind of seeds some control of a game's music over to the player, you know? Yeah, completely. So it's really cool how they do this. Composers create stems or modular pieces of a song and then program the game to essentially compose a full song on the fly, which generates music based on the composer's rule. They call it procedural music. It's a unique way to create music that feels more in tune with what the player's moment-to-moment -moment actions are. But, of course, there are some hurdles for artists who want to release that music onto a soundtrack. Yeah, you know, John and Amanda came up with a couple of interesting solutions when they ran into this with some soundtracks they were hoping to release as vinyls. The first was for a game called Ape Out. It's this really wonderful indie video game that was driven by procedurally generated jazz. In the game, once the titular ape escapes from its sort of prison, drums start to thrum in the background, setting a frenetic pace as the players look for a way out of the prison complex. The ape grabs a guard, and you will hear this tom-tom thudding. And then when he throws the guard across the room, there's a cymbal crash as the guard hits the wall and explodes. Uh, the ape punching the next guard will maybe create a cymbal ding. It's really amazing because what's happening is you're playing as the ape who's trying to get out, but his actions are actually creating the music, sort of bending it to the player's actions. John knew he wanted to release the soundtrack on vinyl the moment he heard the music, but the game's developers were at a loss at how he was going to do this. Then they're like, but what do you mean? Like, it's procedurally generated. Like, how do you release a soundtrack for a game when the soundtrack is constantly changing and it's up to the player? And I'm like, oh, shit, like, I don't know. And then I came back from GDC and we were talking with a few folks at I Am 8-Bit and me and Amanda and a couple others knocked our heads together and we're like, wait a minute, what if we just, like, live recorded a playthrough? And it's like, you couldn't normally do that as a player per se, but since we're working with the dev, they could like toggle some stuff on and off, like sound effect wise, and they could they could play through the debug build and probably create something kind of interesting and special. But like we don't really know what the results are gonna be, but like I bet they'd be on board with trying this. Like, let's see. So we pitched it to them and they're like, You guys are crazy, but that that's crazy enough for us too. And they gave it a good college try and it turned out awesome. Like it was it was one of those things where we imagined it would be kind of cool, but then we're like, oh shit, like this is so good that it doesn't even sound like the thing that happened to get there. The folks at IM8 Bit were so happy with the results, they tried doing the same thing for another popular game with a procedurally generated soundtrack. But this time around, they took a completely different approach. Untitled Goose Game features classical music arranged on the fly by the AI. With that record, the team at IM8 Bit created a double groove vinyl. So every time somebody places the needle on the record, 
The path the needle takes and the music you hear is essentially random, delivering an approximation of the beautiful randomness of the game's music. Now, procedural music isn't going anywhere. It's actually something video game composers continue to try and push forward as they try to match the surprising and reactive nature of the video games themselves. That's exactly what Simon Vicklin has been doing with the music for the survival horror game, GTFO. Now, we told you a bit about this game in one of our earlier episodes of This Is Level Infinite, but we wanted to revisit the game and Simon for this episode because he's doing some pretty cool things with music that's surprising. Simon notes that most video game music is adaptive these days, but what he's trying to do is see just how far he can push that with GTFO. It's a question of how far you take it in terms of like making little fragments of music and then letting the game or the music engine sort of piece it all together at runtime, depending on what, what happens in the game. And that was the concept with GTFO. I wanted to take that as far as I could, you know, and re make like little snippets of music and then the game would sort of piece it together like during runtime while you're playing the game, basically. So the game has a lot of different bass lines to choose from, lots of different like string ostinatos to choose from, lots of different drum loops to choose from. So you would never hear the same piece of music twice. It's not a scripted game. The same thing doesn't happen twice. You can have like jump scares happen, but that's just pure coincidence. You happen to open a door and there just happened to be a monster that the game had chosen would be standing on the other side randomly. You know, there's a lot of random elements in the game and uh, lots of things that are running on systems rather than uh, sort of custom made stuff. And I wanted the music to be the same way where it's sort of living and breathing and, and changing and uh, it's not like when you hear the first few bars or the first few notes of a song, oh, I know this one, it's going to be going four bars and then there's a drum fill and then there's going to go for eight bars and then the strings change and, you know, I don't want people to know exactly how the music plays out. And that's part of, I guess, the fact that the game is a horror game. You want it to be, you know, there's an uneasiness or there's a certain level of being in the dark as to the, the arrangement, like you can change on a dime. To give the game engine the tools it needed to create this on-the-fly music, Simon had to essentially craft musical building blocks for the game, a process that wasn't quite as compelling as he thought it would be. It's just a matter of sitting there in your DAW and creating little snippets of, you know, is it one bar, is it two bars, is it four bars perhaps? of drums and then you create like 8, 10, 12 different drum loops and then you do the same for string ostinatos and then you do the same for yeah, all different layers or uh, stems in the music and then the game can sort of piece them together as you go. But the thing that I learned and it was this was um this was a real lesson for me because I've been working in games and making music for games for over 15 years when I started making the music for GTFO. And I didn't realize it quickly enough. So actually, we launched the game with the system in, but it's really, really boring, <laughs> to be completely frank, to make music like that. You're taking away your ability as a composer to arrange a track. You're just making little fragments of music, and then the game, you leave it up to the system to arrange the music at runtime while the game is running. It picks and chooses the different little fragments of music, you know, the little snippets, this drum loop and this string ostinato and da 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 da. So when you're sitting there and working on the music, you never get to hear a full track. You need to sort of create this set of different snippets and then you export them and then you import them into whatever piece of software you use to implement the music in the game. And maybe there you can start hearing how it's going to be, but you can't hear it while you're working on it. And that's really a disadvantage to this idea. <laughs> and it's unfortunate because uh, I had sort of committed to that when I started working on the game. Jesper Kidd says he's tried his hand in interactive scores over the years as well, and that they're complicated, and that the music simply can get lost. His most recent interactive score was for Borderlands 3. One of the things that we found out early on is better keep the same tempo and write the music in the same key for each map. That way, all these pieces of music can talk to each other. So it's like writing a huge amount of music where you are starting to think a little bit more mathematically, a little bit more like about the transitions, a little bit more technically. 
I do like to not overdo it on the interactive side because you can lose the musical aspect of it if you go too far. Now, I am not against interactive music. I work with it all the time. Don't misunderstand. I am just saying there's a time when you can go too far with it where the music becomes almost like invisible because you are always scoring to what's happening. Like if you're walking versus running, you know, I mean, that's the bit too much, you know, you, you want to make it, you don't, you don't want to overdo it. There's a really nice balance there that you can find, I feel. Sometimes as the artists compose complicated interactive scores, it seems like what's good for the game can feel kind of bad for the composer. Yeah, you know, for example, Simon isn't at all happy with how one particular element of the music turned out for GTFO. He's not a fan of the music that kicks up when you get into combat. In part, he said, that's because a composer should enjoy composing their music. And in this case, he absolutely didn't. He also feels like he gave over way too much control to the game itself. I realized that perhaps I've underestimated the uh, importance of you as a composer being able to sit there and like, oh, I've got a track, you know, I've, I've made something that has a beginning, middle and end. But I didn't realize how, frankly, boring it would be to make the little pieces of music. And also, you have to make so much of it, like so many different little fragments in order for it to even come close to the experience of, oh, I've never heard this song before. The action music is where I'm using the system uh, when sort of you wake up the monsters and the music is, it's random, yeah, but it feels like it's the same track, even though it's like, it actually has a, a, a set of different, uh, you know, drum loops and different sort of layers that you, you can switch out and, and replace and there's stingers in the music and sometimes they come after a few bars and sometimes it comes on the first beat, you know, so you don't know exactly where it, it's coming, uh, but it's not enough. While the outcome is probably hundreds of thousands of combinations, Simon's not convinced players will notice the subtle differences queued up by the game. Even though Simon's unsure if people actually like the music in GTFO, there definitely seem to be a lot of players enjoying it. Yeah, you know, as I was researching for this episode, I stumbled across this crazy YouTube video created by one player who got the creatures, the sort of monsters of GTFO, to chase him in the game for nearly an hour, wow. real time, so he could record that procedurally generated music to listen back to whenever he wanted to. I mean, talk about dedication. Yeah, I mean, you have to understand, you are running from things that are trying to kill you in the game, and he did that for an hour just so he could get that combat music queued up. Wow. And so, of course, I told Simon about it. Yeah, it might be one person listened to it for 12,000 hours. I mean, if only the music could, as it was intended, you know, go sort of up and down in intensity depending on whether the monsters have a line of sight or if they're like behind a corner or behind a, a door or something, then there would be a sort of natural sections in the music where it's like, and it comes back and create this sort of living and breathing something more, you know? It's like starting a car and it has one gear. <laughs> it's like, all the way through. To me, and it's really frustrating uh, that we, yeah, we had to release the game like that, and then then we have it. It's been sort of falling between the chairs since then, but now we're we're really doing an overhaul. But it's fascinating that some people they enjoy it still, and I'm I'm glad that there are some, you know. So Simon's actually planning on reworking some of the music just because it's been bugging him so much. What he wants to do is release an update to the music to launch with the Rundown Seven update to accomplish the original concept he had for the music. Well, part of the reason, and this is specific to GTFO, is that we had this idea that the music should go up and down in intensity depending on whether you're under attack right now or whether the monsters are maybe, you managed to close one of those doors and the monsters are on the other side of the door. They're still looking for you and hunting you and they're going to claw at the door and break through the door eventually, but you're not indirect. You know, they, they can't attack you right now. I wanted there to be a system that can determine whether the, the monsters are actually like really at your throat right now or if they're like, you know, around the corner or behind a door or something. They're, they're looking for you and the music can be to sort of have a pulse and be stressful, but not as stressful and intense and loud as it gets when the monsters are really there. So there would be a, a natural sort of change in dynamic depending on what happens in the game. And that would also create variation 
in the music. And we actually had to skip that because we were so few people working on the game earlier. And this was just down prioritized, you know, sort of put on hold. But now we're like, we should really get to that and fix that. So I have a dedicated programmer who helps look at that system to make sure that the game is going to, yeah, sort of measure how threatened the player really is. And then the music can sort of go up and down in intensity. He added that after the overhaul hits, he would consider trying to get the game's soundtrack or, or some version of it on a service like Spotify, something that fans have been asking for since before the game was even released. John Gibson points out that as video game music has become more sophisticated, that demand to listen to soundtracks outside of the game continues to grow. It's just music is music, right? It's, it's game music, it's, it's movie music, it's TV music, it's, it's hip-hop, it's jazz. It's, I think it can go wherever it wants to be. I think it's limitless. I don't think we've even seen the tip of the iceberg at all. I think there's a lot underneath. For composers like Simon and Jespa, the joy of gameplay is only matched by their personal love for creating music for these astonishing new worlds. Jespa says he sees his music as an essential part of giving these fictional worlds life. The creative process and the fans' response to what comes out of it, in turn, gives him life. World building is always fun, you know, especially if you're building for a world that hasn't been done before. With Dark Tide and with Vermintide, these are such unique worlds. It is just a ton of fun writing for these worlds. I love being out in the, the symphony halls, uh, interacting with the gamers, and, and the passion. I mean, the passion these gamers have, and myself, hearing this music live is just fantastic. And I just love the way uh, the audience has such strong reactions to video game music. It seems like, you know, the strongest reactions to any kind of pop culture. It, it just feels, you know, th there's a difference from playing a game because you can play that game for a hundred or a thousand hours. So you kind of have this relationship with the music on such a deep level. You've, it helps define the experience. And to see that come to light during a concert is a, another thing that's just uh, fascinating. This is Level Infinite is a production of Pad and Pixel LLC. Your hosts are Tony Bernhardt Jr. and myself, Brian Crescenti. This podcast is produced and edited by Brian Crescenti, Dave Tack, and Ethan Vincent. Audio engineering and final mastering by Dan Carlisle.